My name is Craig Barker. I am an archaeologist, I am a museum worker and I'm an educator and uh, what I'd like to do this morning is to talk a little bit about my life in ruins, what it's actually like to work as an archaeologist and some of the fundamental ideas of how archaeology works and what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. Um, so I've got plenty of slides and I'll tell you a bit about my own story as well um, as we go along. But uh, first up, I guess, if I'm saying I'm an archaeologist, we should talk a little bit about what archaeology actually is. Um, and archaeology is a study of the past. Um, but it's a little bit different from history, because history is the study of the past from what people wrote down. Archaeology is the study of the past through material culture. Material culture is basically a fancy phrase which means any thing, any object, any item that has been owned and used by human beings in the past. So what we try to do is to use material culture, these artifacts, these objects, and the context of the environment and the landscape in which the people of the past lived to actually try and understand what it was like to be alive 2,000 years ago, 200 years ago, in some cases even 20 years ago. So part of our job is to, to go out and find these artifacts usually by excavating them on an archaeological dig, and then by studying them and researching them. So here are some images of uh, just random archaeological sites from around the world. One of the things that you'll notice is that firstly, everybody's standing around looking at the ground, and uh, sometimes scratching our heads trying to work out what's going on. But uh, what you'll notice is that there is architecture, um, there are bones in one of the images, and there are objects, there are broken bits and pieces of material culture, these are artifacts that I tell you about. So really our, our understanding of the past is by understanding objects people have owned. And I want you guys to think about what you own at home, okay? The types of toys you have, uh, the types of books on your shelves, the types of games you play, uh, the types of posters on your wall, the types of food in your fridge, um, you know, the types of furniture your parents own will all tell future archaeologists what it was like to be alive in 2014 in Australia. As long as it survives, obviously. So our job is to actually try and interpret and to interrogate all of that evidence from the artifacts to understand what life was actually like. The types of things you own tell us a lot about who you are as an individual, but more importantly in many ways, they tell us about what we are like as a society. And in this particular case, Australia in the 21st century. Um, in other cases, we might be interested in what it was like to be an ancient Roman. We might be interested in what it was like for Aboriginal people living in Australia um, 10,000 years ago. We might be interested in the, you know, the colonial period of Australian history. But the point is we're using the artefacts to try and understand what these stories are. I put up now a picture of um, the main archaeological site that I work on personally, which is a place in Cyprus. And I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later on, but um, I guess I put this image up to indicate the fact that archaeologists work all around the world. Wherever human beings have lived in the past, and humans have been on every single one of the continents on our planet, we have lived, we have worked, uh, we've done things, um, and then human beings have died. And so one of the things that we're interested in doing is looking for these patterns of behaviour. What types of houses do we live in? What types of gods do we worship? Uh, what did we do to entertain ourselves? What types of food did we eat? And funny enough, but by digging holes in the ground and finding this ancient architecture, by finding these ancient artefacts, we can actually interpret and try and understand what it was like. Um, so one of the key things, and one of the great things about my job is I get to travel a lot, as I'll show you, um, but what's lovely about it is that wherever in the world I go, I have other archaeologists' colleagues. So I've worked with people in Cyprus, and I've worked with people in Greece, but I've worked with archaeologists from Denmark, and I've worked with archaeologists from Poland and from England and all sorts of places. So it's really, really exciting to be part of that community. One of the key things for our understanding, and again, I've put up an image which shows what we call stratigraphy. And this is basically a big fancy terminology um, to indicate the fact that the further down we dig, usually the older the objects are. 
So in this particular case, the things found at the top of that picture, in that layer underneath the road construction, are probably relatively new. But at the very bottom of the picture, and you'll see a red and white pole in the middle, which is a photographic scale, um, the objects that are found at the bottom of that are likely to be much, much older. So one of the things that we're trying to do isn't just to find artefacts, we're trying to interpret them. One of the key questions for us is how old is it? And the context that it comes from. Now I mentioned the word before, artefacts, and I, I described you know, the types of artefacts in your house, but really a, an artefact is absolutely anything which has been owned and used by people in the past. So depending upon which culture we're studying in the past, or depending upon which part of the world we are working in, we might find different types of artefacts. But the fundamental thing is that archaeologists will ask the same types of questions. What do these objects tell us about the people who own them? So um, as an archaeologist, I might find ceramic artefacts, items made from clay. I might find coins. I might find stone tools. Um, I might find uh, stone marble sculpture that's been carved. I might find brick architecture. If I'm working on more modern and more contemporary layers, I might even find plastic objects. It doesn't matter. The point is that the object itself tells us a story about the person who owned it and used it. So the most important part of my job, and everyone thinks, oh, you know, Craig, how exciting, you're an archaeologist, you go out and dig. And yes, I do, and I'll talk about that. But the most important part of my job, and the most important part of my research, is actually analysing and interpreting all of the finds that we uncover. So again, the image I show you is from my project in Cyprus. And what you'll see is a whole lot of students and a whole lot of our archaeologists standing around the table with one of my professors, one of the, one of the people who taught me. And you'll see that there are mountains and mountains of piles of broken pottery shirts. In some cases, they're tiny. They're only that big. In other cases, they're, they're larger items. But the important thing from our perspective is that we're going to look at every single one of them because they will give us some more evidence and accumulatively the whole story that we can recreate from all those little broken bits and pieces will give us a much better understanding of our site. In some cases all those little bits and pieces can actually be uh, uh, adhered together by a conservator and so we can actually reconstruct the entire shape of what the ancient vessel looked like from the most minute small pieces. So it's painstaking but it's very very rewarding. Um, and again, also from my site in Cyprus are these pictures of us handling, analysing and interpreting objects. And you'll see that uh, you know, I've got uh, in my hand on uh, one of the pictures all these broken little bits of Roman pottery, um, which don't appear to be very exciting, but altogether they give us a very exciting picture of what it was like to be living in that place in Roman times. Any place that we find archaeological evidence is an archaeological site. And an archaeological site could be something as small as a tiny fireplace where a few people thousands of years ago gathered around to cook a meal, sit around by the fire and tell some stories. Um, in other cases, an archaeological site could be massive. It can be a large, sophisticated city. So I've put up an, uh, an image here of probably the most famous archaeological site in the world, which is Pompeii, the famous Roman city which was destroyed by the eruption of the volcano Mount Vesuvius um, on the 24th and 25th of August in 79 AD, so almost 2,000 years ago. And over the period of time that uh, the site of Pompeii has been excavated, the archaeologists working there have uncovered Roman houses, they've uncovered uh, Roman um, public buildings, um, the forum, the temples, the marketplace, the theatre that you'll see in the very... Um, front of the of, of the image, but the whole story is trying to understand what it was like to be living in that city on that archaeological site 2,000 years ago. What was it actually like to wake up in the morning, to eat some breakfast, to walk to your job, um, to buy some bread for lunch, to go and see a theatrical performance during a dramatic festival, and so on. And we're using the objects, the artifacts, including the architecture, to try and do that. So the fundamental question of archaeology is, is really the five key historical inquiry questions. Who, where, why, what, and when? Um, and our whole point is this issue of interpreting material culture. 
What does the object tell us? What do the artifacts tell us? What can we learn from them? And um, what I've put up is a series of questions because this is basically the way that we think about either an individual artifact, an individual object from an archaeological site, or a whole lot of artifacts together, what we call an archaeological assemblage, which is basically a big, big fancy way of saying all of the objects that we find together. So firstly, we need to identify what the objects are. We need to think about what the objects were being used for. Why was it made? You know, is it a tool? Is it a weapon? Is it religious? Um, another question is, what is the object made from? Is it made from stone? Is it made from metal? And if so, what type of metal? Is it made from plastic? We're not going to be finding silicon and plastic in an ancient context in Pompeii because it wasn't invented then. But if we're digging up a 2014 layer in Sydney, we'll find a lot of plastic levels. Um, this relates into the next point, the question of context. Where was the object found or where was the object used when it was being used initially? And this is really important because it'll give us some indication of how people were living their lives. If we're digging up one of those rooms in one of those houses in Pompeii and it's filled with um, evidence of food, you know, seed survive perhaps, and it's filled with evidence of cooking pottery, then it's a pretty good chance that our context is we've found the kitchen of the house. And that's going to help us with our understanding. The next point on the image is the question of chronology. And this is basically a fancy way of asking how old was the artifact? And you remember I showed you before that picture of stratigraphy, those different layers in the soil. That is one method of dating, but uh, we as archaeologists have all sorts of different techniques that we can use to date objects. The most important question, and the reason why I work as an archaeologist, the reason why I work at a museum, is the next one. And this is the issue of interpretation. Once we've gone through all of these other questions, what we want to do is to work out what the artifacts or the artifact assemblage tell us about people's lives. So every time I'm in a museum and I look at an ancient object, every time I'm digging at my site in Cyprus, what I'm doing at the back of my head is going through these questions. What is that object? What is it telling me about ancient society? How would have the person used it? Where would have they used it? And all of those types of questions. So one of the things I really, really love about archaeology and history is that sense of inquiry, that process of questioning, questioning, questioning. And it doesn't mean the answers I come up with are always right. Sometimes I'll meet another archaeologist or have a different understanding or a different interpretation, but we can get together and, and try and work out what is the most likely scenario. And that's the bit I really, really enjoy. Now, I said before that I'm an archaeologist, um, but as an archaeologist, I work at the University of Sydney. And that's a great place to work because we have archaeological digs all over the globe. Um, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my peers, a lot of my friends are often travelling around. A lot of the people I know have uh, just been working in Greece in the last couple of weeks. So they're all um, on Facebook at the moment saying they're getting on the aeroplane to come back home. But uh, the two, uh, my job at the, at the university is involved in working with um, uh, the museums at Sydney University. And there are two main archaeological collections. One is called the Nicholson Museum, and one is called the Maclay Museum. Our museums are open to the public, so if you guys are ever in Sydney, you can come and actually visit us anytime you want. But um, what's worthwhile bearing in mind is that you don't have to work in my museum. You can go to any museum in Australia, you can go to any museum in the world and think about the material culture on display as an archaeologist would. So the Nicholson Museum is a place that has over 30,000 items from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt and the Middle East. Um, and we have lots of Greek sculptures, we have a lot of Roman ceramic and so on. The Maclay Museum has a lot of cultural artefacts, it has a lot of natural history as well, but a lot of cultural artefacts from Aboriginal Australia, from uh, the South, uh, South Pacific Island cultures and so on. And again, different parts of the world, but we're asking the same question. What do these objects tell us? I guess one of the questions is, how did I become an archaeologist? Why did I become an archaeologist? And it's probably because I've been interested in history um, ever since I was young, even younger than you guys. My mum always jokes that she reckons that she's responsible for me becoming an archaeologist because she um, bought a sand pit for me when I was about three or four 
and I was constantly out the back digging. But I think the reality is that I've always been interested in history. I read any book I could get my hands on about the ancient world when I was your age. And um, the other thing was I always loved being outside. So uh, um, I wanted a job where I could be out in the sun and I wanted a job where I could be involved in history. And so I always wanted to be an archeologist. Rather interestingly, although we dig, and I'm gonna talk about the digging, importantly, I actually probably spend more time inside than I do outside. So I'd spend more time in my museum, I'd spend more time working in a lab, I'd spend more time working in a library than I actually do on my archeological site. But it's all important because it's all part of that process. So over the years, I've worked in a whole range of different countries. I've worked here in Australia, and um, I show you a picture from a site in Sydney um, called The Rocks, the suburb called The Rocks. And this is an archeological site I worked on 20 years ago, which is a bit scary. Um, but uh, um, it's uh, a really important um, attempt to understand life in early colonial Australia. I've also worked on indigenous sites and I've worked in New South Wales, I've worked in Tasmania. But then my real interest when I got to university and I started doing history courses and archeology span courses and I started volunteering on digs, I realized that although I loved Australian history, my real passion was for the ancient Greek and Roman world. So I began to specialize in the archeology span of that part of the world and I gradually did my doctorate, I gradually did my PhD as well. Um, and over the years, I've worked in all sorts of places. So these are some pictures from Turkey, from a town called Zygma. Now, Zygma was a Roman town. Um, people would have been living there in about 300 AD, okay? And uh, it was a massive, massive Roman city that was right on the very boundary of the ancient Roman Empire. So the people there were so far away from Rome that they clung to an identity of what it meant to be Roman. They made Roman style houses, they covered them with wall paintings and with mosaics. But the fascinating thing about this site at Zygma was that the reason we had to dig it was that the Turkish government was building a dam. They were damming the river. And right behind uh, the picture with the, the light on it, you'll see just the edge of a riverbed. And that's the Euphrates River, one of the important rivers in Turkey, Syria and Iraq. Um, so the Turkish government were damming this river and as we were digging, every day, the water level was rising 50 centimetres. So as we began the dig, as we dug deeper, the water level got higher and higher and higher. So it really was a race against time. We had to record as much evidence as possible before it all disappeared underneath the water. So that was a remarkable sight. I've also done a lot of work in Greece and a whole lot of different places. And at one stage, I even lived in Athens for a year. So I show you an image here of the famous Acropolis of Athens um, with the temple dedicated to the goddess Athena called the Parthenon up on the top. And uh, the place I lived in was the, uh, the hostel of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens. So every time I had breakfast, I'd sit on my balcony and watch that, look up at that. So that's a, that's a really tough way to start the day. But uh, remember I said before, it's not just about digging. The reality is that I spend far more time in museums and in laboratories and libraries. So these are some photographs of me working in Cyprus um, in the basements of some of the museums there. I guess uh, one of the first questions that I got interested in was uh, trying to understand ancient ceramics and what it was like to actually um, use uh, vessels, what it was actually like to use containers. So the picture I show you here is from Cyprus again, the place that I'm gonna be talking about mainly from now on in. Um, and this was a series of burials. Um, this tomb, it's around about 2,200 years old. They call them the tombs of the kings. And although the architecture is really, really impressive, there's actually no royalty buried there. At the time they were being used, Cyprus no longer had kings. But inside these burials at the tombs of the kings were these ancient wine jars. And the ancient Greeks called them an amphora, or amphorae for plural. Um, and each one of these jars would have been made on the island of Rhodes, and uh, each one of them would have been filled with wine. So when the ancient person died, they were buried in the ground, and they were buried with two of these amphora at either side of their head, which either says that the ancient people of Cyprus drank a lot of wine, but probably more importantly, it meant that they believed that they were going to go off to the afterlife 
And when they got there, they needed all the same things that we have in this life as well. Now, what's fascinating about these amphora is that we can study them, we can learn a lot from them. So there's a photograph of me carrying one of the broken ones out of the museum to be photographed. But uh, what's fascinating about them, and, and this is a photo of, of a colleague uh, and a friend of mine um, who's a conservator called Wendy. And Wendy's holding up a restored one of these Rhodian amphora. So you can see where it's been broken. She spent you know, a long period of time actually restoring it and, and, and working it together. But uh, each one of these jugs would have contained about 25 litres of wine. It's a lot of wine, it's a lot of liquid. Um, and people always say to me, how come they have a pointed base? Well, the point is, if you tried to pick up that vessel and it had a flat base, you'd try and pick it up by the handles, wouldn't you? And it would have been so heavy that it actually would have ripped the handles off. They would have been broken and pointless. So by having that pointed base, it meant that people could actually pick it at the bottom as well as at the top and almost carry it on their shoulder. Um, the other great thing about the pointed base was that these were used for transporting wine and olive oil and water over long, long distances. So you could actually fill up the whole of an ancient sailing ship with rows and rows and rows of the amphora, and then the pointed base at the top could fit in nicely between four below. So it, practically, and in terms of engineering, it's a really brilliant design. But the bit that I'm interested in was that these vessels made in roads Every single one of them was stamped on the handles. And they had two stamps, one on each handle. One was the stamp that had the name of the man who made the wine. The other was the stamp of an annually changing magistrate, um, basically a government official, which means that we know how old the wine is. So I can go to each of those graves at the Tombs of the Kings and work out the chronology, work out the age of the pottery and the other finds in the burial. Now, the Tombs of the Kings, this place in Cyprus I talked about, is where I do my main archaeological investigation. So I'm really, really lucky that um, I'm part of a project at the University of Sydney that works in Cyprus. And we go across there every year for about five or six weeks. And we work for the government of Cyprus, for the Department of Antiquities. And what we do is slowly uncover more and more evidence of the ancient capital city of the island a town called Paphos, and I'm just pointing at it on the map here. So here's Cyprus, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's beneath Turkey, above Egypt, Greece is just over here, and down here you've got Syria, Israel and Palestine and Lebanon over there. So it's right in the centre of all of these trade routes. And Paphos becomes a very, very important town because it has a harbour. So all of the ships that pass through stop at Paphos to trade and unload. And over the years, we've been excavating the ancient theater, the remains of the ancient theater. So this was a building of which only ruins survive, but this is a building that would have been used for 650 years as a place of performance and a place of spectacle and entertainment. So put your hand up if you guys have ever been to the theater and seen a show. Okay, so all of it. So, um, if you go and see a show today, it's usually in the dark. You usually go at night time. Maybe you go during the daytime if it's a school performance. And the actors are performing on the stage. And they'll do one play and then everyone claps and the show's over. In the period of ancient Greek history, instead performances were held in these theatres in the outdoors. So if it was hot and sunny, you were out there in the hot sun. Um, it was a festival, so you weren't just seeing one show, you were seeing one theatre show after another, after another, after another. And uh, you would have been seated up on the caviar, up on those seats. We think that at the, at the height of our theatre in Cyprus's use, it had a maximum extent of almost 100 metres from one side to the other, and over 8,000 people could have sat there and, and, and watched a performance take place. So it's very, very ruined today. When you look at the pictures, that's all we have left. But what you'll see is that we've got over here the seats. You've got the circular area, what the ancients called the orchestra. This is where the chorus would dance. Um, in English, we, of course, have the modern word orchestra. Um, so it's kind of like the orchestra pit. And then there would have been a massive stage building up here in front of it, of which we only have a line of foundations but that's where the actors would have performed. 
And over the years we've been working there, we have slowly, slowly uncovered more and more evidence. Here is an architectural plan of what the site looks like. But one of the exciting things about being an archeologist is of course I get to work with architects, I get to work with geologists, I get to work with people from the humanities subjects, but also people from the science subjects as well. And here is an aerial photograph. So again, you'll see the seats curved around like it's bell shaped and then the semicircular orchestra down in the center here. And here are the foundation lines of where the stage buildings were. So where the actors would have performed. One of the fascinating things about this site, because it was used for so long, for over 600 years, they modify it and they change it. So our architect has actually done some 3D model reconstructions. And this is how we think the theater probably looked um, during the period of Roman occupation of the island around about 150, 160 AD. So again, almost 2000 years ago. And again, gives you a sense of the scale of the place. And what you'll notice, of course, is that the entire stage was facaded with columns and capitals, many of which we've uncovered as we've excavated over the years, um, ancient marble capitals. And all of this marble is not natural stone from the island of Cyprus. It's all being imported right across the Mediterranean from all sorts of different countries, um, including this really amazing spirally fluted column. So again, all hand carved, and you've got the lines of the flutes going all the way around in a spiral fashion. And that, type of, uh, that type of stone is from Turkey. We've been lucky in that we've uncovered some mosaics at our site as well. So this is what it looks like after we finished. But here are the archaeologists actually clearing the very last levels of soil from the top of it before we photograph it and draw it and record it. This is important. We need to actually have everything cleared so that we can understand how the site was being used. And so we can interpret it, just as I talked about before with the artifacts. Here's a photograph of the team at work um, earlier this year. And we were working in Cyprus just in September, so only a couple of months ago. Um, and it was really, really hot. Um, it was the end of summer over there. It was in the high 30 degrees, incredibly humid. We had to start work at six o'clock in the morning. We started work before the sun rose, uh, before it got too hot and too humid. So here are some of my colleagues and some of my team working on the top of the hill, which is behind the theater. And you'll see that they've uncovered new lines of stone that we don't yet quite know what they represent. We'll investigate this in coming seasons, but this is much, much later than the theater. So what it shows is that once the theater stopped being used for performance in about 360 AD, later on people come, use the, reuse the stone, reuse the architecture and build over the top of it instead. These are some of the things we found and again, you're not going to find intact objects at a theatre site. You're going to be finding a lot of broken bits and pieces of pottery, a lot of broken objects. So on this particular slide, I've got the top of an amphora. Remember the jugs I talked about before? This one is about, oh, what is it? This one is about 500 years newer than the amphora I showed you from the Tombs of the Kings. So one of the things you'll notice is that the shape has changed. Here you've got the top of it, here you've got handles and this would have been rounded down the bottom, it's broken off. Um, one of the things that we're interested in, one of the ways that we date things, is looking how things change through time. Um, just like fashion changes for you guys, in the ancient world, objects, clothes, styles of decoration, types of painting go in and out of fashion. And this is one of the ways we can date objects. So we can date this based upon its form, based upon its shape. The other one I show you is a broken bit of a large marble bowl. And again, remember I said that there's no natural marble in Cyprus. So this has been imported from Greece. Again, we don't quite know yet what the use of it is for, but you'll see there's a little um, black photographic scale on the bottom there, which is 10 centimeters. So this bowl would have been you know, almost a meter from side to side. So it's massive, really, really big. And then I show you this, and you guys are really lucky because you're the first people I've ever shown this picture to. Um, this is a photograph of probably the most exciting find from this particular season, excavating at the ancient theater in Cyprus. It's a little terracotta figurine of the head of 
Alexander the Great, the famous conqueror. It's only about so big. Um, if, I, oops, if I put my hand up like that, so it's not very large at all, but it's made from clay. It would have been made in the Hellenistic period, the period after Alexander the Great's conquest, the period in which our theatre was first being built and used and acted in. And what it shows is just how important images and symbols are. Because in an era before photographs and cameras and the internet and the ability to do link-ups like this, if you wanted your image as a great leader, a great ruler, a great emperor, a great king, to be recognized all over the, 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 the areas that you owned, the areas that you conquered, you had to use sculpture, you had to use statues, and you had to develop iconography. And so Alexander the Great's image becomes distinctive. So this will eventually end up in a museum in Cyprus. Um, so look, it's time for questions. What I was just gonna finish up on is uh, one of the exciting things for me when I'm not working in Cyprus is I get to work in a museum. Um, I get to teach people who come and visit through the museum. I get to research the objects. The Nicholson Museum, we've actually done a lot of uh, replicas of ancient sites built out of Lego. So next year we're gonna have Pompeii, that city I told you about before, recreated out of Lego. So I hope you guys can come along and see it. I've studied a lot of our Cypriot objects. So again, all of my knowledge from what I dig over in Cyprus, I can use on this material that's in Sydney. And I've been very, very lucky that I've actually been able to curate an exhibition of many of these objects. But for me, the most important thing is trying to understand the processes, this idea of historical inquiry. I'm interested in what stories these objects tell us. And all I want to do is ask questions of it and questions and questions and questions. So hopefully this is a good time for you guys to ask me questions about what it is I do. So I'm going to throw it over to you guys now. In the museum or um, what I've found personally? I'll answer that in two ways. Um, the oldest object in the museum um, in the Maclay Museum, we actually have a meteorite, so it's not an, uh, an archaeological artifact, but it's the oldest object. It's over 4 billion years old, so it's really, really old. But in terms of dealing with human material culture, we have stone tools from Europe that are uh, 200,000 years old in the Nicholson collection. Uh, me personally, um, I've uh, excavated Aboriginal stone points, what are called Bondi points, so they're arrowheads and, and flakes. Um, and they're about 4,000 years old. So that would have been the oldest thing that I personally have dug up. I went straight to university after I went to school in Wollongong. Um, as I said before, I wanted to be an archeologist. I went straight to the University of Sydney and kind of never left. So I did, I did my three years as a bachelor uh, bachelor of BA degree at the university, and I did all sorts of other courses as well as archaeology and history. Um, I then did honours in history, um, and then I almost immediately began working on my PhD. But while doing that, I was working as a contract archaeologist, I was volunteering at museums, I was teaching at the Nicholson. So it's literally 20 years um, since the first time I walked on an archaeological site myself. have any really big artifacts. No, look, um, I don't collect myself. Most archaeologists don't collect. It is uh, illegal nowadays for me to take objects back to Australia with me. Everything I dig up in Cyprus must remain in Cyprus. So I personally don't have any artifacts that I've kept. Um, but in terms of size of things, at the ancient theatre, we have found marble blocks that weigh three and a half tonne. So they're massive. And as I say, there's no marble on the island. So someone has carved that out of the ground in Turkey, traveled it down to the harbor, put it on a ship. The ship has sailed all the way to Paphos in Cyprus. They've unloaded it. They've transported it up to the theater and then they somehow have erected it onto the, onto the theater site it's for itself. So architecture would be the biggest things.
there's a whole lot of different ways. So remember I talked about the different layers of soil, stratigraphy. That doesn't give you precise dating, but it will give you a relative dating. Objects at the bottom are going to be older than objects at the top. There's also scientific methods, and some of you guys may have seen TV shows like Time Team, where they've used things like carbon dating and uh, thermoluminescence dating. And if any of you guys are chemist or want to become chemist, this is one way that you can actually get involved in archaeology as well, is these scientific methods of dating. But the most common way for us to date an object in a museum or on a site is these stylistic changes through time. Um, we call it uh, seriation. Um, but again, that's a, a big fancy term, which just means that we see changes over time. And I, I want you to think about mobile phones, the way that mobile phones looked back in the 1980s compared to the way that mobile phones looked 10 years ago compared to the mobile phone that you own. It changes over time. So we can recognize these changes in the material culture. And that's probably the best way to date an object. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in that I've excavated human bodies from a, or from a couple of cemetery sites, actually. And there's something very, very moving about the fact that you are directly you know, communicating with someone who, who passed away a long, long time ago. I'd say in many ways, um, the most valuable in terms of sort of the, the classic definition of value um, is that I've worked on two sites where we found gold coins. I haven't found them personally, but um, there's such a buzz and excitement around the archaeological site when someone does find gold. But I do want you to bear in mind, archaeology is not treasure hunting. It is about information, not about the objects. But yeah, it does get very exciting when someone does find a gold item. <laughs> Basically, because it keeps on being used and reused and reused. So anything that was there tends to get broken and smashed up. There'll still be traces of objects, but what's extraordinary, of course, is that intact things don't tend to survive. And when you guys go and visit a museum, you know, if you get the chance when you finish school to go and visit some of the great museums like the British Museum or the Louvre in Paris or the Vatican Museum in Rome, look very carefully at the objects because Nine times out of 10, they've been reconstructed from smaller fragments. If the object is intact, it's probably from a shipwreck site or it's from a tomb, because these tend to be the two main places where the material doesn't get disturbed. Anywhere else, it will get broken and trashed, generally, as a rule of thumb. Look, it depends on where you're working. It depends upon what the site is. Um, no two archaeological sites are exactly the same, which is also what makes it interesting. But it means um, that, you know, in some cases, we may find really interesting objects just after scraping away with our trowels from the very, very top soil, the very, very top surface. In some cases, we have to dig metres and metres and metres and metres down before you get to anything interesting. So in some cases, you may well dig for weeks and weeks and weeks before you actually reach the exciting archaeological layers. So it depends upon which site you're working on. The theatre itself, we began digging in 1995. So we've been working there almost 20 years. Um, the first time I went there, I was a student. Um, as we've gone along, I've been very, very fortunate in that I've been promoted and worked my way up and I've done more and more research and more and more academic writing. But, um, so that's about five, six weeks every year for 20 years. Not me personally, but sometimes we find objects that are not in a context where we would expect to find them. So that's quite exciting. The whole question of, for example, I've, I've already spoken about marble in Cyprus is, is, is really, really interesting. Um, but um, no, probably not anything new as such. The whole aim is to accumulate more and more and more knowledge and to consult with my colleagues and to publish our findings so other archaeologists in other parts of the world 
can go, oh, the Australians have found this in Cyprus. Um, you know, they're dating it to that. That's really exciting because this helps with our knowledge as well. So the most important part of my job isn't digging the hole in the ground. My, the most important part of my job is interpreting it and then publishing it so other people can agree or disagree or try and understand my interpretations. Uh, I don't have a picture of it, but a lovely, lovely little um, uh, marble figurine um, from the theater site was gorgeous. Um, I've also, oh, some, some, yeah, some very interesting um, decorated pottery as well and some of the different places I've worked. But probably those mosaics in Zygma as well. Um, the ones I showed you weren't the ones I worked on, but uh, there are some gorgeous, beautiful scenery on some of those mosaics. <music> I've, I'm trained as what we call a classical archaeologist, the classical cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, but my real passion is for the Hellenistic period, this era after Alexander the Great, because what you have is a real mixing of Greek traditions and Greek um, culture with older traditions in places like Egypt um, and in the Middle East. And so something new and unique comes out when cultures mix together um, and you know, brand exciting new things develop. So it's always interesting when different people come together and see what happens. And that's reflected in the archeological record. That's important. No, no. Um, and um, uh, in many cases, yeah, there are stories of curses of mummies and things like that. We have mummies at the Nicholson Museum. Um, archaeologists don't believe in curses. If anything, it's what the damage that we do to the objects that is the curse, not that, what they can do to us. To the best of my knowledge, modern science has distinguished that there are only two diseases that can survive in the ground for long periods of time. That is smallpox and anthrax. So they're pretty nasty diseases, let me tell you. Um, but uh, we believe that they can't survive for any longer than 200 years. So at this point in time, it is absolutely impossible for anyone who excavates a human body or an animal carcass for that matter from the ancient world to pick up an ancient disease. But what we can do by forensic and medical investigation of those human remains is to understand the history of pathology. What types of diseases were there in the ancient world? How did ancient people treat them? How did they survive? Because that may well help us today to understand how we treat diseases as well. And many of the, the, the research projects that I'm aware of that have dealt with ancient human bodies have had modern medical outputs as well. With a lot of patience and a lot of skill. Um, so I personally don't do it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty patient person, but um, it drives me nuts sometimes doing it. So it's a very, very particular type of person who is a conservator. If any of you guys are good at jigsaw puzzles, um, it will be a brilliant career for you. Um, and conservators work at museums. A big part of what they're trying to do isn't just glue something back together. What they're trying to do is to maintain the chemical integrity of the object. Um, and so we want to stop it from decaying. We want to stop it from deteriorating. So, uh, yeah, it depends on what it is, but it can take weeks and weeks and weeks at times. I think the most important skill is patience. Um, you need to read a lot. So if you're interested in history, read blogs, read websites, read books, watch TV documentaries. Um, just have an interest in what's happening, trying to understand um, how, it, how it works. Um, because we work in many different countries, it's probably also worthwhile picking up different languages as well too. So language skills are quite useful, but the most important thing is just to read and read and read and read. A 
I've not worked as an archaeologist, but I've been to Egypt. I've traveled to, I've been inside one of the pyramids. Um, so uh, when you guys finish school, you must travel and, and visit all these amazing places. I think archaeology chose me rather than the other way around. Um, as I said, I've, I've always, always loved history. Um, and to me, um, I just really enjoy looking at things and, and trying to figure them out. So I guess it's problem solving, this whole question, problem solving. Again, uh, back to that one, but yeah, problem solving, yes, yes. But I get to meet and work with some really amazing people too. Um, it's a very social academic field. Um, so we, we're often working together as a team. It's not just me out there digging Cyprus by myself. There's a team of an architect and photographers and surveyors and um, pottery specialists and you know, students and all sorts of people. So that's fun as well. I couldn't tell you personally, but I, I would say that at the ancient theatre, over the almost 20 years we've worked, we probably will have found around about 200,000 individual items. Now we only record and catalogue those that we call diagnostic, those items that are going to give us more information, more interpretation. But our, um, our inventory of catalogued items is up to 9,000 items now. So around about 10,000 items. Yes, I have. Yes. And it's, 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 a, it's a very moving experience because this is a real person. Um, and uh, it's, it's even less abstract than holding a, a jug and saying this was owned by somebody who lived 2000 years ago. What you're actually looking at is someone who did live and die 2000 years ago. Let me just, uh, I'll put the picture back up if I can. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Um, there's a very distinctive style of his hair and a very distinctive look. And this was developed by uh, an ancient Greek sculptor, a man called Lysippus. Um, and Lysippus was employed by Alexander the Great to be his court artist. So what he did was to turn a lot of Alexander the Great's physical imperfections into aesthetic, into beautiful traits. So his hair was lion-esque. It flowed in the, in the, in the wind. Um, he turned his head in all of the poses. So because of the particular style of decoration, now ours is a very poor quality um, version of the Lysippan head. It's a knockoff of a knockoff of a knockoff of a knockoff. Um, whereas if I was to bring you in a marble statue that was actually made by Lysippus, you would see this incredibly beautiful man. Um, in many ways, he kind of looks like a movie star. And what Lysippus has done is to invent a tradition of making people look more beautiful than they actually are. But uh, the fact that it's so recognisable that in my very, very poor quality third, fourth, fifth generation copy, I can still recognise his hair shows you just how distinctive that look was. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see you at a museum soon. <laughs>